much for being here. This is our first official uh, East, Northeast International Film Festival. I should say the International uh, Newburgh Film Festival. Um, we're doing a series of panels, um, each one covering, covering a different topic uh, within the film industry. This one is called Sound Without Sound. And uh, two very special guests, uh, Jacob Ribikoff, who is a personal friend of mine. And also, I consider him an industry giant in this uh, field. Uh, very impressive resume. I won't go through the whole thing, because I know we're trying to get this started. And Carl Weldon, right? Yes. Please we haven't officially met. Robert Edited. Fontana, I'm so happy that you are here. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I, I'm sure these guys are going to have some wonderful things to discuss and, and reveal about their careers and what they do. Um, and I'm excited to have them. So please, let's. Uh, Take a moment to listen to the room you're in right now. Maybe you hear the hum of these QSC speakers, or maybe a, a buzz of a light somewhere, maybe the din of traffic slipping in under a tiny little thin break in the door. Maybe you hear conversations coming up the stairwell in the back of the room. We're never completely in you know, a silent realm. Uh, our environment is full of this invisible stuff, this sound. Um, when we're in the womb, everything's floating in anti-gravity, you know, you're just a glob there, you can't see anything or smell anything or taste anything and everything feels the same, but you can hear. Sound is your first introduction to the outside world, your first perception of anything outside of yourself. And uh, to be able to work in a medium that can tell so much and transmit so much information um, that people don't even realize is there half the time. There's something kind of imperceptible about it a lot of the while. And uh, when sound goes away, we tend to get really uncomfortable. When I watch a horror film, it's not the screeching noises that make me jump out of my seat and nervous, it's when there's nothing. And I get anxious. And then sound starts to come in, and I, I'm in an environment, you know? If I hear crickets, maybe I'm in the country. If I hear church bells, it must be a Sunday morning, you know? It can tell so much. And uh, I work in location sound, so mostly capturing dialogue on set. Uh, so unless it's a silent movie, you know, getting, getting the words and uh, what the writer put out there, you know, um, out there for, for the screen. But uh, today we have uh, the luxury of having with us a uh, sound designer, sound editor. Um, and, uh, and you've got a, a list of things too. But um, anyway, I'll just... Uh, I guess uh, turn it over to you. You've got the little clip you want to show us, and yep. uh, and then we'll talk about about why you're all here today. Okay. Well, I don't. Can we? Is it possible to dim lights, turn yeah. off lights for about six minutes? So this is the immersive. Right this is the immersive portion. <laughs> On that square. Where? This? Yeah. There's a button. A button. Do I turn it up? That's it. Well, right. That's a I'm right here. So, um, I think the best way to convey to you what it is that I do is to show you. So, what you're about, what you're about to look at is a, I worked on, I uh, was one of three sound designers um, on the Ken Burns Vietnam series. And what you're going to see is the opening of, I believe it was episode two. And... You'll see, um, I'm not going to describe it too much, better that you just experience it, but you're going to see the same clip three times. The first time you see it is just going to be the veteran telling a story, his own story, his own experience. And you'll just hear his voice, he's sitting there telling a story. And then a little bit after he tells the story of the opening credits, um, and then that's it. Second time will be the same clip, but in addition to him and his voice telling the story, is the sound design. So that's where I come in, that's my work. Um, and that's a mishmash, a grab bag of all kinds of different sounds from voices, to whispers, uh, footsteps, explosions, um, field radios, etc. The last layer will be those two, the first two layers plus the score, music, 
Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross were the uh, composers, uh, and then you'll hear a little Miles Davis at the end of that. And um, so I think without further ado, take a look, take a look at this, and then we can, uh, talk, we can talk further about that, and then I know Carl has a lot to talk about. Yeah, right? I've got some, some so questions we'll put out there, and then we'll... Maybe I'll... There. Not, I don't want to be in your way. So let's become audience members for a moment. Okay. I was assigned a listing post at Kantian in the fall. I was like getting a death sentence at a trial because that's just three Marines out there with a radio. And that's the scariest thing I did. You're listening for the enemy. They call you on the radio every hour. Delta Lima, Puck 3, Bravo. Delta Lima, Puck 3, Bravo. This is Delta 3. If your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, key your handset twice. If your situation report is all secure, break squelch twice on the handset. And if it's not, they keep thinking you're asleep, so they keep asking you, if your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, and then it finally dawns on them, maybe there's somebody too close for you to say anything. So then they say, if your sit rep is negative Alpha Sierra, keep your handset once, and you damn near squeeze the handle off the, you know, a two on the radio, because they're so close that you can hear them whispering to one another. And that's scary stuff. That's real scary stuff, and I'm scared of the dark, still. I still got a nightlight. When my kids were growing up, that's the first time they really found out that Daddy had been in a war when they said, well, why do we need to outgrow our nightlights? Daddy's still got one. this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans assigned a listing post at Kantian in the fall. That was like getting a death sentence at a trial. Because that's just three Marines out there with a radio. And that's the scariest thing I did. You're listening for the enemy. They call you on the radio every hour. Delta Lima Pop 3 Bravo, Delta Lima Pop 3 Bravo is Delta 3. If your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, key your handset twice. If your situation report is all secure, break squelch twice on the handset. And if it's not, they keep thinking you're asleep, so they keep asking you, if your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, and then it finally dawns on them, maybe there's somebody too close for you to say anything. So then they say, if your sit rep is negative Alpha Sierra, keep your handset once, and you damn near squeeze the handle off the, you know, and two on the radio, because they're so close that you can hear them whispering to one another. And that's scary stuff. That's real scary stuff, and I'm scared of the dark, still. I still got a nightlight. When my kids were growing up, that's the first time they really found out that Daddy had been in a war when they said, well, why do we need to outgrow our nightlights? Daddy's still got one. this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans Kantian 
in the fall. That was like getting a death sentence at a trial. Because that's just three Marines out there with a radio. And that, that's the scariest thing I did. You're listening for the enemy. They call you on the radio every hour. Double link, pop three, bravo. Double link, pop three, bravo. Let's tell the three. If your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, key your handset twice. If your situation report is all secure, break squelch twice on the handset. And if it's not, they keep thinking you're asleep, so they keep asking you, if your sit rep is Alpha Sierra, and then it finally dawns on them, maybe there's somebody too close for you to say anything. So then they say, if your sit rep is negative Alpha Sierra, keep your handset once, and you damn near squeeze the handle off the, you know, and two on the radio, because they're so close that you can hear them whispering to one another. And that's scary stuff. That's real scary stuff. And I'm scared of the dark, still. I still got a nightlight. When my kids were growing up, that's the first time they really found out that daddy'd been in a war when they said, well, why do we need to outgrow our nightlights? Daddy's still got one. time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans those of you just joining us, welcome to the Sound Without Sound panel here at the uh, East Northeast Film Festival, the Ritz Theater in Newburgh, New York. My name is Carl Weldon, and uh, today our panelist is uh, Jacob Ripikoff. And uh, I've got a few questions I've whipped up here to sort of go through things, but uh, I think uh, toward the end of this time, we'll, we'll take some from the audience as well. So we'll just start off with uh, how did you get started working in sound, and when did it become a career? Hmm. Okay. I think, you know, your intro kind of gives a clue. I probably started interest in sound from day one, popping out of the womb, you know. And um, I worked for somebody once who, who liked to say that we were not born with ear lids. So, you know, it's always there. Sound is always there. Um, but I grew, up in a, I grew up in a household of storytelling. My father wrote some novels and loved telling jokes. And uh, my both parents were really into, I grew up in New York City. My parents were really into movies. And so I, they kind of passed that on to me. And uh, at one point when I was uh, around 11, me and a friend uh, started a collection. We collected silent comedies like Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd. And then we would take a, you know, a record, usually ragtime, and, and put that uh, on a record player and just for birthday parties, first for our own enjoyment, then birthday parties, you know, play that along with uh, those movies and see, wow, that really works, you know. Uh, one of us, uh, I got the idea to try uh, Beethoven's uh, Appassionata Sonata with uh, Charlie Chaplin's The Immigrant, that short um, of Chaplin's and found, wow, this really, it's amazing how, you know, moments sync up. So that was, you know, that was probably really the first example of putting uh, sound to image. But then I went on to, I had different interests. I played the saxophone for a while and then I did some acting and some writing and out of college, wasn't sure, took some film courses and stayed long enough to just sit through the credits and after the caterers and, and you know, the grips and the gaffers and the accountants, at the very end I saw sound editor, um, a location sound mixer. So I knew at that point, oh, there are people that actually do something like that for a living. So that was the first inkling that, that there might be a career out there that might combine all of the things that I was interested in. So, you know, then it was a long, then it was just a, a process of um, slowly working on student, student films for free, doing location sound on student films, but also doing the, the sound editing at the end on some student films. When I first came in, we were still in the analog world, and then um, 
I think it was 1991 that I went freelance. Um, I had one job, I had one month long job and then nothing, you know, just a big sea of nothing, like what's gonna happen next. I had no idea whether this would work for me as a career or what would happen. And it was a slow process of year after year. First I didn't know location sound or post-production. I wasn't, I didn't even really know what the difference was. So I was doing a little of both. But I quickly learned that if you were doing location sound, it's a, you know, it's a thankless, difficult job where uh, no one wants to wait for you to get the sound right. You know how to best mic your actors, but can you get the boom in there? Can you get the mic in there? There are shadows and directors and, and, and um, ADs, and nobody on set wants to stop and wait for the sound guys to get it right. So you have to do your job in the background while they're blocking a scene and setting the lighting. You're supposed to be kind of practicing, figuring it out. Um, tough. Um, then at the end of the day, you take your work, you hand it over. In the, when I first started, that was actual reel-to-reel -reel tape, and then eventually it's a hard drive. You hand it over, you say goodbye, nice working, you know, you do the whole project, and that's it. You don't, you have nothing uh, more to do with the sound after that. So I was kind of in it for something creative, and also I realized that doing post production, that's the phase in the process of making a film where everybody is, the director especially, is actually going to come back and focus and think about the sound, um, as opposed to while the sound is being shot. There's a million other things going on that the director has as a priority and is focusing on. So I realized that, I, that it was post-production that was going to be for me. And so um, I guess around 1991, I went freelance. And um, yeah, and, and so it was a couple of years of working in the analog realm. And then around 93, all of a sudden, it was like overnight computers came in. And, um, you know, that would be the beginning. There you go. Uh, you touched on this a little bit in that, um, so there are sound recordists, sound engineers, sound editors, and designers. What makes them different for, say, for anyone who is not familiar with those different roles? From each other. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, you have the, the, the sound engineers, well, the, sound, the location sound mixers or recordists location, that's, that's all, that's only recording the dialogue for a film, um, and their objective is to get the voices as clean and clear as possible. We want, you know, you want them to be intelligible. You want a minimum of tone in the background, and especially where it's, whether it's a documentary or it's a narrative piece with actors, you want to capture whatever you're capturing that's, that's incredible, whatever magic is going on either it's a performance or you know it's a it's it's an interview you want to make sure that that it's all there cuz the last thing of course that you want is either you don't get it at all or or it's being interfered with because you've got um, you know environmental sound that's going to get in the way so that's the most important thing and then sound editors so in post production you have re-recording mixers sound editors sound designers supervising sound editors I like that, yeah, it breaks into the sound editors, actually breaks into dialogue editors. Uh, the dialogue editor is the person who um, is taking all that, that location sound and cutting it together, cleaning it up. You have, you'll have recordings where it's different takes and different angles and the tone behind the person who's talking is actually different. And of course, you don't want to see a movie where someone is in the middle of talking and meanwhile, while they're talking, it's in the background so it's it's cleaning that up but it's also preparing it so that later on a re-recording mixer will be able to get in there and do more smoothing out and cleaning up of the of the um, dialogue the spoken dialogue um, Foley editors Foley in uh, on a movie is where we go back into a studio and record sound effects specifically related to human bodily movement, so footsteps, um, hand pats, uh, glass being put down, um, you know, clothing rustle, things like that. And when you go to see a movie, there's a lot of that. You know, someone walks across the grass in a movie, 
and you hear their feet across the grass. I mean, you walk across some grass, right? In real life, it makes no sound. There is no sound for a person walking across grass, but in movies there is. So there's, there's a certain amount of, of hyper-realism and, and things that we want to do to help tell a story. And Foley, especially, is a way of adding a visceral, kind of physical extension of every character that's in the movie. And you can do things with their feet and the way they sit in a chair and, and, and sort of amplify their characters for the storytelling purposes in a movie for dramatic reason. Um, you have ADR editors, that's uh, automatic dialogue replacement, right? And, or, or loop, looping editors. And those, that's where, similar to Foley, we come in after the fact and where maybe some of the dialogue was not recorded so well and it's not intelligible, we have to re-record the dialogue so it's clear, so we have to bring the actor back in to watch and look at themselves and in sync redo their lines or because the director wants to change a performance or maybe add some off-camera lines for story purposes that were not there ever there originally you know that's done a lot to, to you know cut away or an establishing shot and there'll be a couple new lines of dialogue that give some information that help the story um, so that's ADR, and then there's sound effects um, and sound design, and so that would be like what you saw here in that, that second pass, where you're adding everything from the crickets, the, the ambient sound, wind, air, traffic. Um, Whispering via Tom. Yes, the whisper. You know, we brought, we brought, um, we actually got a group of Vietnamese speakers in, and for three days they came in and we recorded enough for ten episodes, and we had plotted out certain specific um, uh, events that happened during the Vietnam War, uh, like the fall of Saigon, and we had them recreating all the way down, from, all the way from whispering to big kind of mass pandemonium and chaos. So, you know, we... Battle shouts. And, right, yeah. exactly, right, battle shouts. Um, so, you know, that's another aspect to it. Um, and then sometimes there's, a, you know, the, the sounds that you heard breathy sounds, sounds that are not uh, literal sounds, but they're just tones and things that we <laughs> figure out some way to, to come up with. But, you know, we'll take, uh, I've taken like a, the sound of a robin uh, song uh, chirping and slowed it down and suddenly you get this great eerie, um, you know, kind of moaning sound. Um, so, you know, there's that aspect of, of the work as well. So I think... Yeah, that yeah. maybe covers. Yeah, there. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of things you, you don't hear on set. You certainly would not have heard any of that in during the course of a, a sit down interview. Right. You know, yet an environment was you know put into place and uh, transports the viewer. You know, and uh, as to speak, speaking as to the, the hyper reality of sounds, um, if you were to close your eyes, you could still tell what the action was because you're hearing those little noises. Right. You know, whether it be you know. You know, someone, you know, does that in the newspaper or whatever else. Um, you know, uh, Foley being a performed sound mm -hmm. versus uh, some other sounds being designed, you know, or having a library of them from field recordings and, and things like that. Um, so, uh, so for yourself, um, you know, a lot of people see a location sound person on all the behind the scenes. You know, they've got a boom, they've got a recorder, they're wiring up actors. You know what they're doing. But... Your workflow is is hidden in a studio, and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't get to see, you know, you know how it starts and how it finishes. I mean, what what did it take to get you know those passes? I mean, knowing that people came in to do, uh, you know, background and voila and whatever else. So, what's your describe your workflow? Yeah, um, it starts. Sometimes I'll get a script for a movie, which I actually love reading scripts because it's the only time in the movie you can actually make the movie yourself while you're reading it. You know, and you have this, you have this, you know, this picture in your mind of what the movie is as you're reading it. But for and for me, I'm sound oriented, so I'm immediately starting to think of the environments and and then depending on what script you read, sometimes the scripts you know get into more or less description of sound. And that gives me, a, if I find a lot of descriptions in a script of sound, now I know, oh, this is cool because the director is into sound. The director is conscious, thinking about sound. That's going to be more fun for me. 
Um, so that would be the first step. Then maybe you might see you know, a rough cut or something. But the next thing that's the next most important part of the, the workflow, the process, is what we call a spotting session, which is when we um, sit down with the director or maybe the picture editor as well. And we go through the whole movie and talk about sound. And so that's, that's the time for the director to, to get all uh, his or her ideas out to just throw, you know, and again, it's interesting because depending who it is, some sound can be a very difficult thing for people to talk about. It can be very difficult for people to come up with words to describe what they're hearing in their head or what they want to hear. So, you know, I'm always at that point during a spotting session, I'm trying to get as much adjectives, you know, just tell me what you want the audience to feel or what, you know, just that kind of thing. Because at that point, for me, it's like I almost like an actor who wants to know what's my motivation. You know, I want to know from the director what's your motivation, but what, you know, how do you want to tell the story? A lot of times you'll see the movie and the movie will tell you. You don't, you know, you're just from watching the movie, it's, it tells you, you know, what it wants to do. But you want to know, you especially want to know when the director says, you know, we, we, we have this idea um, for how we want to use sound in a scene, but we're not sure how to do it, so, you know, how would you do it? Um, so that, that's very important, the spotting session, because that's where you kind of get a road map for, for what the director wants and how you can go about doing it. Then at that point, you have a, a team of sound editors. So those are the sound editors that I just mentioned before. Foley ADR, dialogue, sound design. Um, and that's where you know, everyone's going to go off and on their own, separately, by themselves, they're going to work on their respective type of, of sound. Um, and we, the industry standard as a, uh, you know, technically as a platform is Pro Tools. It's a, it's a software platform that's um, usually used with Mac, but could be used. I've never, I have yet to meet a person who uses it with Windows, but it can be. Um, and that's where we're either working on headphones or working with speakers. Um, if you're a dialogue editor, you really do want to use headphones because you can get closer to the sound and, and hear um, you know, little ticks and mouth clicks and things that you want to get rid of. Um, if you're doing sound design, you want to work with speakers because you know that you're going to, you know, traditionally for so many years and the way I was trained, we were working with the ultimate goal being the, 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 the theater, right? A movie theater. But that's kind of starting to, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of moving away because everyone is watching content now on television at home, on earbuds, on headphones, on laptops, on phones, on, you know. So, so it's interesting because that whole, most of my career training and gearing towards an open space and the thing that was sort of, we groove off the most was just making something come alive in a big space and utilizing the surrounds and the back, the front, you know, for me it's like I want Ideally, I want it to be as immersive as possible, and my favorite projects have been the ones where the movie and the director, you know, are both in, you know, both want to achieve something that's immersive where the sound is all around you. So I think the challenge as we move forward is how to keep that immersive feeling, but just in a pair of earbuds, you know, and, um, or headphones. And after all, headphones are making it immersive. It's kind of shutting out the outside world, but it's very different from the way we worked, have been working in 5.1 or 7.1 or uh, now Atmos. So, I mean, that's sort of, the workflow then is we, we work as editors and then all of our work comes together in the mix, what we call, you know, it's the mix where uh, there's a re-recording mixer sitting at a board, you've seen the pictures of, uh, you know, mixing boards, consoles, and that's where the director comes back Sometimes a picture editor will be there with us, or maybe a producer will be there, or you know whoever else the director might want to have there. And that's where you're sitting with the director, you know, every day for a week or more on a feature, and you're you're mixing, you know, um, scene by scene, and, and putting all those elements, music and sound effects and foley and uh, you know Robert remembers how that was um, and it's a great process I mean that's really for me I live for that 
part of the process where it's collaborative and um, all these elements come together and then you, you know, and that's where you can kind of pick and choose and really shape what's going to end up telling the story. Um, and then once it's finished and you're, everyone's satisfied, you know, and you do a process of reviewing several times in your mixing studio until everyone's satisfied that it's sounding the way they want it to, then you're ready to unleash it out into the world. <laughs> there are some technical things right in between there with formats and um, labs and things like that, um, you know, and that's a little treacherous sometimes because the way it sounds in the mixing studio is perfect. You know, you, you're in a um, soundproof room. You have no, you know, you, it's a tuned room. The speakers are tuned. Um, there's no, no exterior sound. It'll never sound that good. Even in a good movie theater, it won't be that good. So you know that once you send it out there into the world, it's going to have a very uh, rocky passage as it goes, you know, from theaters into people's headphones, into their homes, into all kinds of crazy environments. But it's, so it's kind of like you want to, in your sound design, you almost want to make it environment proof and make sure that, you know, something will sound good, even if it played in mono or stereo. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the workflow. That literally is the flow of, of the, the move the sound for the movie and how it then goes out into the world. A friend of mine, the producer Dean Jones, you know, has a, he uh, he always keeps some crappy speakers around right. to listen to his work through, or he'll let's do it in his car and just you know is, if it can sound good on any system or in different environments, you know, uh, you know, proofing it as it were because uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you're going to be listening to things on earbuds or whatever else, or, or uh, you know, you'll have We'll have all these different uh, environments to test it through. Right. Um, I know that uh, you know when you're adding you know these elements to the picture, uh, you know that layer of narrative goes with it. But I, I always call it to my memory. Uh, uh, some years back, there was a, a, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre trailer mm -hmm. that had no picture for the first minute. Uh huh. Right. It was Brilliant. just sound. It was the sound of a, a woman running and breathing heavy and, you know, doors opening and closing and then followed by heavy boots and some thumping and crunching and then, you know, the pull of a two-stroke engine. You don't see a single picture and you're just mortified. And it's, uh, you know, how, how you're able to, you know, find, uh, you know, some emotional portrait you can paint, you know, with, with all that. Um, you know, that's, that's the creative side of it that... Uh, you know, we get to put in outside of the creative part the job and getting the job uh, you know you get into the industry you make a name for yourself um, what are some of the most challenging uh, parts of the job is it finding projects or the, the deadlines you have for them or you know what good question what kind of yeah easily hands down the most challenging part of the job is is finding the work finding the projects it's once you're in a project, for me, there's even the worst horrible deadline and is so much more desirable than going out there and looking for the work. And it's a, you know, that, that's where it's, it's truly a bit of a crazy mystery to me. Um, you know, I've, I've, worked, I've had the good fortune to work with a lot of great directors and, and on a lot of great films and projects and, um, but even to this day, you know, it's com very competitive. It's competitive in New York City. It's competitive everywhere. And there's a lot of people out there who are good at what they do. And, um, you know, like this year for me, for some reason, it's been tougher. Like, you know, I've gone after some jobs and not gotten the jobs. And other people have gotten the jobs. Uh, the year before was incredible. You know, a couple years for in a row, amazing. And, and I got some great jobs. So, you know, it's... Um, I find that that aspect to be mysterious and very, you know, um, it's just, it, it, it cuts both ways. You know, there's been some great fortune and then there's been some really bad luck. And I think that's, that's a freelancing. I mean, you know, that's going to happen to all of us that, that do that. Um, Take heed, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned before, uh, you know, starting out in analog and then computers arrived and, and you kind of stopped there, but I'm wondering if you could speak to the role that uh, changing technology has had in the course of your career. I mean, 
you know, working remotely uh, has happened to so many people in so many different fields. But uh, you say it's very competitive if someone else is getting, you know, newer, faster gear or things like that, or is it all, is it all in the hands of the artist? And, and what, what role does the technology play for you? Yeah, that's, that's it's play, plays, I think the first answer is to say that since I came in when things were analog, it's just about rolling with the technology as it changes. And honestly, it, it's stabilized to a great degree, I would say over the last five to 10 years to what it was. I started in 91, as I said, 93 computers hit. From 93, for maybe a 10 year period, let's say, from 93 to 2003, that was like the wild west of digital. You know, it was just crazy. Maybe pro, pro, we had a few, we had Pro Tools, Sonic Solutions, and Avid Audio Vision, and those were the, in New York City. And I know there were others, you know, in other parts of the world, in LA and everything. Those were the three big ones. And then there was something about Pro Tools that was a little more intuitive to use it. So it, it after, you know, by let's say the year 2000, it had pretty much, you know, pushed the other platforms away. So really for most of the time it's been Pro Tools as the platform that everybody uses. But Pro Tools in and of itself, I mean, there's been all kinds of changes within what it's like in the box to use Pro Tools. But, you know, that's still a, a, a digital hard drive signal. Um, but what that ends up being played out on has really changed. So, you know, we started on mag with, with you know, sprockets and analog on sprockets and, and film stock and mag stock, which was oxidized film stock. And that's where we were using, um, you know, uh, splicing blocks and you know it was very labor intensive and every single editor had an assistant working with them and then when you went to go to mix you had dubbers which meant that every every single track that you were bringing to a mix was a reel a physical reel of mag stock so it was a thing that weighed you know whatever i don't know pound or something, you know, whatever it weighed. And, uh, and you had stacks of those, and each one of those had to be strung up on a dubber, and it was a big mechanical machine. And then you had a whole bank of these machines. So it was, and you had people that needed to, you needed people to run all of these things. When we went to digital, all of a sudden, all of these tracks, you know, that was literally a big physical pros production to have a track, suddenly in Pro Tools, I mean, we're dealing with 256 voices or tracks currently um, or more and so it's all in the box and suddenly as one person you don't need anyone else you can just keep layering track upon track I mean the way working in analog you would have to imagine okay let's say I'm, I'm cutting a scene um, and I, I have ambience and then I have some specific effects and then I have Foley and all these different things and I kind of want to design what that scene is going to sound like, I used to have to hold the sounds in my head as I played one track on a flatbed or something, uh, you know, and, and there was a, you know, just keeping that stuff in your head. As soon as we got computers, we could just throw everything into one uh, big vat and, and kind of experiment that way. So, you know, we went from, from mag stock to, um, to eight track, um, tapes, digital audio tapes to um, magneto optical discs as the kind of final format that something would go on to, to hard drives. Um, and now we've been working the same way with, with hard drives um, for you know, a good 20 years. Yeah, the, so. wave, the wave file has been around for 20 years. Right. Meanwhile, ask the camera department how often their formats have changed in that span of time. It's unreal how many, you know, and how many cameras they've had to give up, you know, like uh, along that process. Um, we, you were talking earlier uh, for the panel uh, about, uh, you know, organizing a sound library. I mean, organizing a sound library digitally versus, you know, having, you know, having, you know, carts or tapes or anything like that. Um, you know, just how you tag your files and, and having it all, uh, you know, at, at, the, at a few clicks of a mouse accessible and available and that you can get sounds from other editors that you could share them back and forth and right. um, you know uh, uh, things like that um, 
Now, for uh, anyone here who's worked on set, uh, I like to pose this question. Is there anything that people can do on set to help the post process later? I like to see if I can get a few wild tracks once in a while or get the sound of an actor's efforts or, or, or you know, little noises, uh, you know, getting room tone, things like that. But, uh, you know, I don't see where all that ends and how it helps or how it doesn't help or what they wish they had. So how, what, what can happen on set that, uh, that helps you later on? Well, it's, you know, aside from what I, I said before, which is just re the primary thing that can happen on set is that we get a good, clean recording of all the performances, that we do get some wild track of room tone, which is kind of a technical, uh, has a technical purpose, although now we also have software that generates room tone, and all we need is the tiniest little sample of room tone, and we can generate enough room tone to last, you know, for 24 hours or wow. something. Um, but I would say if it's possible, and there's a project that I'm going to be working on in the spring, it's a feature film called White Tiger, and it's being shot in India. And in fact, they, they're supposed to start shooting as we speak. And I was on the phone with the location mixer a week ago, and this, this director is very into sound, and I read, had read the script, and it's a movie that takes place, it's about a, a guy who drives a, uh, who's a driver for wealthier um, clients, and he comes from a very poor background in India. And, and um, there's so much of the movie that takes place in cars and on streets, and it's, there's a, a, a rural town, and then it ends up in Delhi at the end, and it's, so it's a big urban, um, soundscape, and I'm reading this script, and I'm thinking this. All, I mean, we can't we can't recreate the sound here in New York City or whatever. This is going to have to come from you know real sound from the locations in India. I quickly asked, and I think I knew the answer. They weren't going to have enough money to send me back at some point to go around recording, and and honestly. I think the solution that we came up with is better anyway, which is that the location mixer, who's from India, who works on projects locally, who knows, you know, knows the soundscape, the landscape, he's going to do a lot of extra recording. A lot of times during the course of a shoot, even though you talk to him, I may have the chance to maybe on the job. What's great is that I'm on this job so far in advance, which doesn't always happen. but. Um, even when you sometimes talk to the location mixer, like for example, I worked on a series that's on now, Godfather of Harlem, um, and I spoke with that location mixer, and we talked about you know trying to record the period cars in the early '60s, and you know the, even though there are good intentions, a, a movie shoot is very hectic, and there's very little time for anything else but the scenes that are being shot. So. At least, you know, they have agreed on this, this uh, movie White Tiger coming up to take some extra time and to pay the location mixer to go out and record some dedicated, and he already was thinking, uh, you know, making a list of car recordings, including the car's doors and the engines, recording at the tailpipe and recording under the hood, and, you know, he, he's going to do all that stuff for us, which is a huge help. So any kind of ambience, if, if the project is not in your locale, if it's not New York City, and I'm in New York City, you know. Um, any other project that takes place somewhere else, anything that can be recorded from that, uh, that area is, is invaluable to us later on. You're not going to hear a Chevy engine in Delhi, uh, right. but you're not going to hear you know, local birds singing their song here in, in New York. Right. You know, like, you know, so it's, it's you know, that, uh, you know, have to catch what you can from either way. Um, so, uh, a description of the job is out there, and what if you want that job? What if you want to get into this? If you could uh, maybe give some suggestions or advice to someone who would want to get into your field. Um, it's hard to, in terms of, of post, uh, you know, sound editing, in New York City, I know it's very hard to break in because it's not a... It's a, it's a nice size community, but it's, you know, say compared to Los Angeles, it's pretty small. And p 
people have been doing what they do for a while, and I have people, you know, coming up to me all the time, and I'm willing to bring people in and show them what I do, students. Um, but it's but it's possible, and obviously there there are people of all ages, and people are breaking into the business. I think the the best way, let's say in New York City, is you find a, a facility, a sound house, and you. Um, start at the bottom and that could be being a runner or a messenger and then you get into um, you know making transfers and um, you know maybe then eventually being like a, a assistant to the a mixer in the studio uh, the other way is by another way and a way that I was able to get started like I said was working on student films where you know if you if you're young and you have a, a friend who's making a film or you know it doesn't have to be a student just someone you know who's making a film and it's all very low budget and they know you're passionate about sound and they know that you're you know you heard your whole world view is sound and th that already is an asset because that's what you want to do and you're saying I you know this is my world this is how I live and breathe it's it's what I hear and I, I see the world and I tell stories with sound I think that's a that's something that that's all you're already bringing something to take to the table in terms of you know your personality you just have to be humble but I think confident you know you want to let people know what you're interested in and what it is that you want to do um, or what it is that you may have had some experience on you know a smaller level doing but you want to now bring it and you know learn more about it um, and and if you I think if you um, Express a desire to want to learn, and you you're in that kind of learning mindset that people, you know, people will will teach you. Yeah. My follow up to that is on the professionalism of, you know, telling someone what they shouldn't do when they try to get into such a specialized uh, field. I mean, you know, it's, it, you mentioned personalities and being humble and such, but uh, you know, case examples of, of something that would get you know, someone you know, not necessarily blacklisted, but not called back for jobs again. Or, or, you know, what kind of behaviors or you know, things that... Um, presuming to know and do something that you don't know how to do, but, you know, I should actually, I should put an asterisk next to that because when I was starting out, there were jobs that, say, like location jobs, when people were making a lot of music videos, I remember, you know, saying, you know, someone saying to me, do you know how to run playback for a music video? And I said, sure. And I didn't, had never done that. And I went to the sound house where they were renting the equipment on a Friday. Let's say the job was on a Monday. On a Friday, I got the equipment. I brought it home. I read the manual. I learned how to use it. And on Monday, I was ready enough, you know, to be able to run the equipment. But I would say, you know, it is a person. I, I would say mainly being humble in the sense that, you know, stick to what it is that you're there to do, if it's a collaborative, you know, just don't, I mean, it's it's just life, you know, don't piss people off, don't be an asshole. If you know the director is wrong, don't, don't, <laughs> like, do, you, do you, right. you still do what they say, or do you right. say, like, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do them a favor and make it better, and then find, you know, like, it, it, sometimes I wonder, like, the, you know, the boundaries that, uh, you know, The director's never wrong. Yeah, oh. the director's never wrong, ah. you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, and then and then the, the industry very quickly weeds out, you know, just the people that somehow grate and, and rub everybody the wrong way. You yeah. don't see them around for that long. Yeah, they're, they're gone. So, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the story that sort of bluff your way into playback. Uh, I got into radio that way. You know, I got a tour of a studio and named all the equipment I saw around me, and they said, "Well, the job's yours." And then I ran home and. Tried to learn all the stuff. Right. I only knew the names of it. <laughs> I only knew the names of the equipment because I had a broadcast catalog in the back of my toilet tank that I would read. And so I knew I knew what the stuff was, but right. I had to you know catch up. And uh, you know a lot of it, you know, a little bit of fake it till you make it. Sometimes gets your foot in the door. Yeah. Definitely. Um. You know, that's uh. You know, but of course, you know, someone has once defined a, an expert as someone who's made made every possible mistake in a narrow field. Um, so here I'm going to ask uh, if you would uh, think about any uh, struggles or mistakes that have helped you gain expertise in your career. Let's see, struggles or mistakes that have helped me gain expertise. Whether they're poignant or embarrassing, either one. <laughs> um, 
you know, I would say I would say like in in doing sound design and sound effects. When I started out, everything you know, you 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 want to create this. It's like you're a composer, and you're and you have you want to create this world. And the whole what you're doing is you you have the film, but you sort of want to make it more evocative and bring people in. And you know, and you start cutting sound effects. The thing is, you have to. We then quickly. So I started doing that, and whatever you know, the first one of the early projects show up at the mix and. There's then the score and the music, and really the order of like the the pecking order, the order of priority would be, you know, dialogue first because everyone has to hear what people are saying, then music, then all the sound effects and everything else that's sound related. And I very quickly got a lesson in, you know, I cut a, like a walla walla is like walla, it's like people talking in the background, and we call it walla. And uh, you know, I remember I think it was a, a documentary about the West or something, American West, and I had cut these voices and found, you know, like voices that really sounded like they were out, you know, in the field and everything. And had that in place and then the director said, you know, let's have music here and I don't want to hear any voices here, you know, so we're not gonna use that. So it was learning that you can't be precious about anything that you're doing. You could you could cut an elaborate scene, and I've seen it happen um, on projects. I, there was a movie um, that I worked on as a sound effects editor, The Good Shepherd, uh, Robert De Niro directed that. And there was a scene um, in which Matt Damon, uh, the character, things are beginning to come unraveled for him emotionally, psychologically. He's walking through a, I think it's like a, a, a village in, in, in maybe in Africa or in South America, I can't remember. And the person had done amazing sound design where there was church bells that were slowly kind of, you know, being twisted off, tune, out of tune. And it was just a, a sonic, great sonic representation of what is happening to him and his character emotionally. And he's, you know, becoming paranoid and he's, you know, all of these things are going on. And it, like I couldn't imagine a better way to convey that and I thought this is brilliant. I heard it. I thought this is brilliant. And there's no way that all the people involved and in director are not going to love this, you know. And I wasn't in the mix um, for that project, but I remember seeing the final film when it was done. And there was just there was score there, and um, and now the score could have been brilliant, but in this particular case, it was very neutral. Like it was just, you know, it wasn't bad, it wasn't good, it was just there. And I just like, you know, I remember just this, this, this feeling of disbelief, but knowing that, you know, score will take, you know, precedence uh, oftentimes. So, you know, that's just one example of, of just not being too, you know, um, not holding on too tightly to, to things that you that you cut that may eventually, you know. As has been stated, the director's always right. Right, the director's <laughs> right. exactly. Uh, what was your favorite projects, one that you're really proud to have worked on? It's impossible to, to pick just one. Um, uh, Me America, I think, was. Thanks, <laughs> Jay. Uh, Thanks. Jay uh, uh, <laughs> Um, no, that, that really, I, I think really it has to be for me the ones where, um, you know, where directors were willing to go further with sound. Um, there's a movie, Light Between Oceans, that, that I think was a, uh, it was like a DreamWorks Disney film that, um, I was a sound designer on it and there's a storm and there's scenes on, it takes place in, uh, on an island off the coast of uh, I think New Zealand or Australia after World War II. And there's just some very great, you know, impressionistic kind of um, scenes of storms where the director had said, you know, I want you to go beyond just the sound of a storm, but I want human elements in there. You know, so so that's one project, and there was a, a there was a documentary called Leviathan, which is is about um, uh, the it it's all takes place on a boat uh, on, off the coast of New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts, and it's very raw and it's very immersive and it has no plot 
There's barely any dialogue, and it's it's loud at times, but it's it really puts the viewer, you know, at times you feel like you are one of the fish, or you are a seagull, or you are a piece of machinery. Um, you know, that's a project I liked. I, I, I enjoyed doing, I worked on The Wrestler with Darren Aronofsky. Um, that was another one because he also is very much into sound and that was sort of, a lot of the, the films I've, as it turns out, if I have to look back and see a thread through a lot of things I've worked on, it's kind of this reality, but you know, pushed a little further than reality. So you're sort of starting with a documentary, and The Wrestler is a good example. It's like a seemingly a documentary aesthetic but actually, there's stuff that's kind of secretly folded in there that's, that's you know, um, very left of center. And um, so, you know, those are projects that I've enjoyed. Uh, oh, also, I do have worked with Roger Waters, and that's not film. Um, and that's where, that started as a film project, so it was his, his concert movie of The Wall uh, tour that he did between 2010 and 2012, but that has uh, documentary sections in it in between some of the songs where he's driving around the European countryside and he's going back to visit the grave sites of his father and grandfather who both were killed in World War I and World War II. And they asked me, you know, we want, for those sections, we want the voices of death. We want voices of death. What, what is that? Uh, you know, we want spirits. We want, you know, so it gave me a chance to try and come up with sound that was not reality based. So I think any projects where it's not reality and allows me to be able to do something more, you know, uh, abstract, I like those. Projects. Sound can really take you out of the situation, <laughs> for example. If he's um, the lady. Yeah, she's. Uh, my last question for you. <laughs> um, how would you envision the, uh, the future of sound design? If there was things that you'd like to see, or what, you, what trend do you see things going in? Or how would um, I, I like, I think the future of sound design is good, or the present is better in that it seems that the world, that somehow sound design within the context of filmmaking has raised in terms of the level of consciousness and the awareness by both viewers and directors, filmmakers, that they place a higher premium on sound design. So if you get involved with a project, you're more likely now, it's more, li more likely now that, that the filmmakers will say sound design is important to us. When I first started out, it was rare that that would happen, and storytelling within tele television or film in terms of anything besides dialogue and music, there was not a whole lot going on. So I think that it's going in a good direction in that sense. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, and I think just because, yeah, we're flooded with content, and I guess that, that's, I think most people think that's a good thing, I think sometimes maybe it means that great projects get lost in the you know the onslaught of endless content that people can just continue you know, but it, it does mean that there are lots of projects getting made and lots of stories being told, and more chance for sound design. So I think we're you know yeah I think I'm hoping in the future that more will heed that mantra of sound is half the picture that you know the uh, you know. They're slowly starting to learn that most films that are rejected from film festivals are re rejected on the grounds of bad sound. Um, right. You know, and you know it, it doesn't occur. How 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 hopefully in the future it will be less of an afterthought. Um, if anybody you know enjoys movie set memes, there's one like when will they realize sound is important? You know, in post. You know, it's like it's a. Uh, sometimes this this like I said, it's an invisible problem. People don't perceive it. You know, you can point a camera at something and see one subject and shutter out everything else. And you know, uh, but sound travels everywhere. It comes through walls, around corners. It, you know, you, there's no ear lids, like right? How you said, right? And you know, example, we're we're in this room, and and uh, all I could think about was the ice cubes falling into that water cooler back there for a moment. <laughs> Wrong back here. You know, so I hope that everybody, um, you know, while you take something away from from what we discussed here, that you listen to the world around you a little bit differently. That, yeah, we maybe we will weave a hyper-reality into a film, but also 
try and you know try and notice uh, things that have always just been things you've taken for granted. I'm not saying you should listen to the world like a David Lynch movie where you can hear every single buzzing light and steaming radiator, but that's a start. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know how we are on time, but uh, we can open it for a little question and answer. The last thing uh, we'll, we'll go for there. So if uh, anybody has uh, any other words. Ooh, 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 me, me. Um, all right, so we're in the Hudson Valley. Uh, you know, we're all talking about indie films moving up here. Jacob, what's the average budget for audio post production on a film or a project you're working on? Oof. Um, Ball, that, ballpark average. Yeah, yeah I mean that that's very wide ranging, anywhere from like ten thousand, you know, or maybe less. That's really low. To five hundred thousand, you know. Or more. I mean, it's rare that I've gotten to do much more than that, but they're they're out there much more than that. Um, so let's say to pick an average, maybe on an indie film, it may be uh, maybe around a hundred thousand. You still thinking ten percent of the total budget used to be allocated, Robert? Right? When you go to film school, ten percent for audio and uh, music. And music. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, if you're just, yeah, it's like they said, if you're just thinking about content, not thinking about sound, yeah, that's, part, that's pretty... You know. No, I'm just, you know, you could look, obviously, we're in the Hudson Valley, if we're doing this in Newburgh, you know, we're, maybe everybody except you, Jake, is looking forward to bringing film this way, you know, and obviously one of the big factors is budgets being, coming down, but just getting smaller, and how, and how has that affected, you know, is it, uh, you know, are you seeing that push, that squeeze in New York? You Definitely. Know? Definitely, because for example, there's much more television going on in New York than film, because really um, what used to exist as a mid-level budget movie, which was maybe a drama with lots of talking, but not a big sound effects extravaganza, I mean, those kinds of movies are becoming, tele have, have become television, have become, you know, an HBO miniseries or, you know, a Netflix show or series or whatever. So, and in that, and I've directly, you know, my last few projects have been TV series, uh, Godfather of Harlem, Escape at Danamora, and it's, um, the budgets and the schedules are lower. With my experience, the budgets and schedules are lower and with the, and lower and shorter. And with the schedules being shorter, it's crazy. I mean, for what we're used to, the time, that we're used to spending to to uh, just to you know apply our craft um, is just really really being cut into and we're scrambling around and it's tough because people put in extra hours because they have this certain integrity they don't you know as much as everyone says on paper oh if it's a two dollar budget then just do a two dollar job on it you know like just do cut corners and just like you know just just do it quickly and throw it out there and the clients will get what they pay for it's really hard for us to do that it's, it's kind of really very hard and people will take advantage of that because they may know that it's hard for us to do that and yet you know the market will be such that if all the jobs are going in that direction then for any anyone to continue working you have to take those jobs so there is you know there, there is definitely an aspect a tough aspect now in terms of the budgets getting lower and that has a domino effect on how we work and how we're forced to scramble around to get the work done so, yeah. i'm finding the same in location sound budgets are getting lower uh equipment is getting less expensive yeah. you know i show up with forty thousand dollars worth of location sound equipment meanwhile someone is buying a consumer kind of great version of what I've got and you know we'll, we'll underbid on the job and you know it's like well that's and that's teaching the producers oh we only need to budget this much in the future um, and then I try and say but but I've got this stuff and they just they might not get it you know yeah um, hi hi I came into the business actually I met Robert on the show Santa Barbara and I always used to shoot with blimps and every time I want to show up on any set they always say, you know, check in with the sound guy. They just want to make sure that you're able to keep yourself quiet. And I've always had a nice relationship with sound guys and the importance of, you know, keeping like, noises off or noises that you make. Because now, when yeah, I... Camera blip? Yeah, yeah. To keep the motor quiet. 
or I would try and shoot during rehearsals so that the sound people can get the best when they go to actual shoot. So have you noticed in today's times, is there same amount of noises or is there a lot more things quieter? Because I know the newer cameras are mirrorless. So I've seen guys shoot on sets with a mirrorless with no blimp. It doesn't make any sound. So is it like for the guys out in the field dealing with less noises? Um, you know, well, there's a, there's a lot of noises we can't perceive. You know, uh, uh, there's a lot more radio interference than we used to have. Uh -huh. So while no one's ears on set are hearing problems, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get hits on our wireless that we wouldn't have gotten a while ago. Um, our wireless spectrum is shrinking, telecom has gotten a lot of it, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, you've, like I said, uh, you know, a camera can, can focus on something and, and whatever is not in front of that, you know, lens can be shuttered out. Sound, we don't have that luxury. There are, you know, you know, I don't know if people were using leaf blowers decades ago, but now it seems like everybody's got one and weed whackers and, you know, uh, you know, phones going off, uh, you know, trucks going by far away. More people are on sporty, loud bike motorcycles and such. Uh, or extra, you know, your, your dogs Panama. are barking. Your, yeah. Because so we hear people talking. You people need to Panama. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that very often, you know, it's like, yeah, you just need to act like you're talking, just smile and nod and, and, and uh, you know, try and, uh, you know, fix it all later with, uh, you know, get, getting wallet. Or uh, say they're in a dance club, you know, there actually isn't music playing in that scene. You know, maybe there's a, a low frequency rumble to give people a sense of timing for the, the music that hasn't, that won't be put on until later on. Um, you know, but everybody has to dance totally quietly so that the two people talking can be heard. And then, you know, everything else gets filled in later. The clanking of silverware at the restaurant, the, you know, the popping of champagne, paint corks, people talking and yelling and celebrating, you know, all that stuff is not caught on set, you know, because we're all pantomiming, you know. Um, but if, uh, if they do enact that at some point, I try and get wild tracks of it just so that later post will have an example of what those noises would sound like in that room. Uh, there's a process called worldizing, where they will take, uh, say, the music at a, at a dance party, and instead of just dropping that track onto the, onto the film, they'll put a speaker into a room somewhere and put microphones at a distance and play the music through a speaker, and you're listening to it uh, as though it were a sound system playing in a room because if you just drop the you know untreated noise in there or try to digitally make it sound like the background music it might not have as much you know reality to it and how important too i just have one more question of the sound guy going out with the crew and they start doing locations and listening for noise that's a luxury if sound gets invited on the tech scout <laughs> i i send them with a, a, a checklist um you know uh, things to look out for, you know, is there a furnace going off? Are there, you know, uh, doorbells and phones? Or is there a playground nearby? Um, you know, do you have squeaky pipes? Uh, you know, train. Train is a train nearby. Um, I've had uh, someone say, "Oh yeah, you know, we should be fine at the location." And we get to the location, and uh, there's a playground next door with a squash court, a basketball court. They're doing lawn maintenance that day, and. There are songbirds in all the hedges around the location, and we're doing day for night. You know, it's it's sometimes you know it's like ah, and so of course I have to salute the post process for being able to you know, uh, you know, remove a lot of what we can't shutter out. You know, um, you know, get get the mic as close to the talent as we can, capture as much clean dialogue as we can. I know a lot of actors mumble sometimes now, but we're fighting the good fight. Uh, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, give as much to work with. Uh, signal to noise ratio. Right. Getting as getting as as long as as long as the dialogue is louder than what's in the background. Right. Um, you yeah. know, we're in better shape than you know. We're not in a studio. We're not in a, a voiceover booth. Um, and I like that you mentioned room tone. Now you can generate it if you just get a little snippet of it. Um, if that isn't available, capturing silence to, to fill it in. Um, it's just like camera department taking a, a plate shot of a scene so that they can, you know, clean things up later, you know, in a, you know, getting, getting samples of the room to cover up noises we don't want. You know, if, 
if there is some noise, you can mask it out with a little bit of room tone. How many people say like, oh, we can fix it in post? And it's like, um, can we try and fix it? Fix it in free. Right. 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 And you can't always fix it in post. And especially when we're talking again about low lower budgets, that's where there are times you know it's going to cost a lot depending on the problem to fix it in post. Uh, I mean, we do have some better technology that is amazing how it's able to get certain artifacts or, you know, um, uh, what's the word, you know, sounds that are, that are di different or other than what you're, you know, like for example, there was a film I worked on um, in, yeah, so, you know, it would be like 15 years ago. And there was a scene shot in a, it was a night scene shot in a van where the two characters are just sitting in a stationary van having a conversation. And it's nighttime, um, it's supposed to be nighttime, but they shot it during the day and there's, there are birds, you know. And I remember, I was a dialogue editor on that, and I remember because the technology, the software was not there yet where you can filter those birds out, you know, by drawing them on a waveform or drawing out a, a wave blob or whatever. Um, and I went in and, you know, was cutting out the, every single bird and filling it with tone and, you know, I mean, it's just those, those kinds of things take a long time. The pantomime thing, even though it, it's true that, that conventionally it's true, you want the actors to pantomime, there have been some projects where there hasn't necessarily been the resources to later go back and do the group ADR to redo the, the individual people talking and you see their mouths moving where there's been a desire to want to hear that later on, but we don't have that and sometimes I wished that there was a way that, that you could capture that where you, the actors in the background were not pantomiming, but yet you could also still record the location dialogue, but yet have the actors and get both, you know, I think, you know, but that's more complicated of a setup to do that. Thank good, you. Good stuff. One of the things I noticed shooting outdoors uh, is that I never realized how much air traffic <laughs> now that's usually you don't listen to it, it's just there. But when you're filming, oh man, another one. <laughs> it's true, and even in you know, areas that, that seem to be secluded, there's no, you know, there are no houses, there are no residences or buildings or anything anywhere around, it's still there's air traffic there. So yeah. There's a true. little scene in All the Presidents Met, uh, where Dustin Hoffman and uh, an actress are sitting at a table talking and an airplane comes through the scene she just talks louder you know it wasn't you know like there was no you know, she, she, because you know there's an airplane there so you know and it's yeah, just like had to be an accident you know it's just like you know yeah, yeah I don't know if it was scripted the airplane goes by she's shouting you know for emphasis but you know um, you know we try and get uh, an establishing shot of the road to show that the scene has got traffic you're going to have traffic nearby or you know, um, you know, and if uh, if there's a lot of bird song we're shooting day for night, well, if you've got a stock file of lots of cricket and cicada recordings for nighttime, then maybe you can you know now cover that in. But, uh. This is a two-part uh, fields question. Field oh boy. Question. Um, so with tech companies buying up the frequency bands, how do you stay up to date with which wireless frequencies to use? And then um, as well, when you travel to other countries and use a wireless system there. Do those change with what you should be using compared to the U.S. Say you're going to Europe or Africa or something? Yeah, I, I've got some sound mixers that say, "Oh, I'm still using my so and so," and then suddenly here's short. Oh yeah, I got nabbed. Uh, you know, I pinged some FCC thing, and and they came right up to my, you know, right up to my cart and looked at what frequencies I had, and said, you know, and it's like, wow, they they're doing that now. It's not that they are actually actively seeking people who are using the frequencies that aren't allowed anymore. But if you ping a telecom tower, they report it and then they have to follow up on it. So if you're shooting in the same place every day. But um, I, I, you know, in getting started, I got as much used equipment as I could. And, you know, you wonder, why is this wireless so cheap? Oh, because someone knows that that's going to be phased out of legal use in the United States shortly. Um, you know, so I bought new things that were wideband, things that took up you know, several blocks of frequencies so that I'd have more, more choice. And as far as overseas go, 
uh, a lot of us talk to each other. A lot of sound mixers will, you know, will say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to be in Istanbul. What frequencies are good there? Or what's the local sound house that I can go to and rent while I'm there? Um, you know, just, just to know. Uh, there's, you know, there's this ability to communicate and know ahead of time. And the manufacturers, of course, were scrambling to re-block the things. And it, 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 it cost a lot. Schools and little community theaters couldn't afford to replace all their wireless. Suddenly, had all this illegal. You know, I think October this month is the mm. is the, the when the time is up for the six hundred megahertz band. But um, yeah, you're you're in a live sound world back there on the console. But uh, it's uh, you know it's something you know something that you you wouldn't have thought of uh, had the cell phone you know pervasiveness not gotten as 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 much as it has. Um, it's uh, I don't know. I trust the boom <laughs> more than the than the wires generally. Yeah. Uh, Ken Strain, I guess, has got this quote now. He's uh, it's like the you know, the labs capture dialogue, the boom captures the performance. You know, in, in that environment. So, uh, but there are nece- but the labs are necessary. The wireless is a necessary evil of it. Uh, so we you know we employ them and get as much information as we can so that post has more choices they can make. Right. You know someone turned their head away from the boom well at least we caught it in the lob or you know or oh they they walked they walked too far away it was a wide shot and we couldn't boom it you know all those things everybody else knows everything about sound you're all set <laughs> no any production jokes sound guy jokes so let's come back to the Hudson Valley yes so uh, so Jake so what are your feelings about you know productions you know working up here and doing audio and video post up here you see it you know I mean I have you know lots of friends in the business you know and they're all scrambling where are they moving to HBO I think it's moving a, a lot up here you know Amazon Netflix they're all yeah you know yeah you know, um, what's your feelings about uh, the prognosis for for work up here versus the city um, it depends, you know, I think... And that's not personal, I'm just saying... Right, no, 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 it's, yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think it's easier in, in uh, sound post, it's easier now for the people on a crew or a team to be anywhere. I mean, you because people work at home, um, there was a project, that's, which is by now is actually a while ago, I worked on was another Darren Ar- uh, Noah, the Darren Aronofsky movie, yep. where I was a, one, of, one of several sound effects editors. And there was, so there, you know, the, the supervising sound editor, sound designer was in, in LA. There was, this dialogue editor was working in Toronto. Uh, I was working in New York City. Another sound effects editor was working upstate New York. Um, and you know, and we were all doing what we had to do for that project. And then it was just all funneling to this, this, uh, supervising sound editor in LA and he, and then he was coming to New York for mixes. So that is simply a way of saying that you can work up here and you know, this is not that far from New York city. If the idea is that you're then, I mean, you could have a group of people here. You could have a mixing studio here. I think the only thing here. It seems to be a thing. Well, you could. I'm sorry, yeah, that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could. You know, it's just. <laughs> All right. Well, there's there are tax incentives for you know well, like yeah. as well. So union, to right, we're, we're you know, to, outside of the union, fifty mile radius up here. Uh, you, know, you know, that effect. You know, that certainly has to be having an effect on budgets. You know, people trying to keep things under certain budgets for unions and stuff. Yeah, I know. Like. They get they get certain funding if a certain amount percentage of the crew is hired locally or post process crew is hired locally. Um, it's it's a really exciting time for for all all kinds of people in the industry here in, in the Hudson Valley. Um, from uh, Mary Stewart Masters and the Stockade works in Kingston and, and her you know other other productions from there and um, um, you know the growing um, yeah Umbro Sounds it is uh, you know. Um, there's you know more film festivals popping up. Here we are, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, hey, I'm so glad you're, that you guys came out to this. You know, uh, you know. There's just a more more awareness of it, and people are wondering, you know, where was this shot? I mean, I think there were five feature films being shot in the Hudson Valley this past summer. Yeah. You know, and then there's also you know there's also you know commercials and short films and documentaries and you know so 
Uh, well, like I, I have a friend who's an editor at HBO, Jerry Hare. I don't know if you guys know him or not. No. Um, and you know, he's been trying to get us into do post, you know, for a long time, and he's just like, you know, vetting us in the whole process. And he's just like, Alan, if you were in the city, he, he was saying about two years ago, Alan, if you were in the city, I could throw you to work. Mm -hmm. He said, but you know, it's just really hard for us to get it out. But now that HBO is moving up, he's like, you know what? There's hope. I I, I see a light. I think I'm going to be able to, you know, get you some throw you some work. So. I found social media been a benefit if you have a local, you know, production groups that you're part of. Uh, you know, people will just tag my name when when a project comes up, and yeah. you know, I mean, that's a luxury oh, I didn't sure. have a while ago. You know, yeah. So, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, it keeps me keeps me going. Um, my website's been down for over a year, and my phone just keeps ringing. I mean, yeah. you know, just referrals, referrals, referrals. So it's a lot of who you know. Um, but uh, I know a lot of people are moving their studios up here because it's quieter. You know, they can you know they can not have ambulances and jackhammers and you know sirens going all the time because they're the, the Catskills are peppered with little little facilities and things like that. And, and uh, you know that's that's a benefit as well as having an absolutely gorgeous environment that looks great on camera. That you know we have uh, you know a, a little less noise uh, so let's in go certain parts of the area. So Atmos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously Netflix put out a, a thing that they're, you know, all, you know, has to be delivered in Atmos, you know. Um, I think HBO, I don't know if they uh, instituted it yet, but I know that they're about to, you know, that it's, they want it all delivered. Um, you know, are you still uh, seeing the struggle for people to make the switch? Okay, so what that looks like for me and projects that I've worked on is that right now that delivery requirement of Atmos is mainly a non-functional archival request. So the technology that's out there, whether it's in theaters or people's homes, to, to actually use Atmos is not really out there much yet. It, you know, it's not a common, it's not commonplace in people's homes to have Atmos um, or in movie theaters for there to be Atmos. You know, there are a few here and there, but generally, so it's a, it's an, I think from what I've gathered, it's the industry kind of trying to cover themselves for the potential that that will be a medium uh, in the future. But I think that medium hasn't really taken hold to the point where we can all say that's, that is, you know, uh, not just an industry standard, but a consumer standard. Uh, because until it's really a consumer standard, until it's worth it for movie theaters to have Atmos in them, until it's worth it for people to go out and buy an Atmos home theater system or virtual Atmos or, or whatever it might be, um, I don't think, you know, it, I think the future of Atmos is debatable. I think it's in a kind of purgatory right now where it could, it could become the standard and it may not become the standard. I think the standard is like the earbuds is becoming the standard because, um, you know, and, and uh, a pair of stereo speakers um, because, and, and what you may be able to virtually do in, with like a sound bar under a television or something like that where you know the technology is there to take something very simple and and throw the sound around you, your living room and make it seem as if it's all around you you know um, I think that's where you know and I there's probably more that I could stand to learn about that and, and what's going on in terms of something that's delivered as let's say a stereo track but it's encoded in such a way that, that if you have the right kind of system at home, it's going to then play in, in you know, a certain way that's going to sound like it's, it's more in, or immersive. Right. So I think we're in a, in a time of flux with all of that stuff and where it lands. I think Dolby uh, is pushing at most because they basically lost everything else that they had uh, where they were, you know, there was an industry standard that every movie soundtrack had to be Dolby, uh, Dolby Digital, Dolby Approved. We would, in our part of the process, we would, when we were finished uh, mixing a movie, Dolby would come in at the end of the process and you would make a Dolby Master. And I mean, that was, that was good for at least 20 years of doing that. So that, that was Dolby's bread and butter. 
now no one needs to go through Dolby to release a movie um, in 5.1 um, or in any other way. So Atmos, though, is Dolby, so, you know, but maybe there are other versions well, of Atmos. Well, the Beatles just, they just remixed the White Out, or no, uh, Abbey Road, and they released it in 7.1 audio only. Um, Atmos audio only, right? Did you say? There's a Blu-ray Atmos. There's a Blu-ray Atmos mix. Oh. You know, I'm just to say that the industry right. is, you know, it's, 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 you know, they're trying to push it, you know, and when right. you, you're going, Shane, you're going to a demonstration at Dolby next week, right? At, at, at the AAO cool. show? Cool. Report you know. back to us. Well, yeah. Women's, uh, women's audio missions down at Dolby. Mm-hmm. Cool. Nice. Uh, anything else? Otherwise, uh, I'd just like to ask, if, uh, is there a way anybody can uh, contact you or reach out to you about your services? I would say, yeah, you know, my email is a good way, and that's uh, jrib44 at gmail.com. You know, that's it. I mean, you can, you can send me an email, and then we take it from there. I think that's, the, that's really the best way. Right. Well, I want to thank you all for being a wonderful audience and, uh, you know, quality. And uh, thanks for coming to East by Northeast here at the Ritz Theater. And uh, I want to thank our, uh, our videographer, Simon. And uh, I think that's about it. That wraps our session. So uh, have a great night. Thank you. My name is Carl Weldon, and you can find me on all the social media platforms out there, I suppose. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.